<laughs> thanks. And uh, a great talk, John, and thanks for the endorsement. I'm going to end this talk by doing what you did amazingly. Instead of in 20 years, in two weeks, I'm going to show you how one could do it in two seconds. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be uh, my, my uh, finale anyway. Um, by way of introduction, uh, one of my favorite introductions of all time was my then eight-year-old son, who I brought to the hospital and uh, um, showed him our brand new filmless radiology department. In Baltimore, we had the world's first filmless um, radiology department. Um, went to digital, and now pretty much everybody's done that. And I showed my son Steve a uh, rotating uh, brain image, and I showed him a chest radiograph, and wasn't really sure at eight years old whether he was really paying much attention or was very impressed. Until a few weeks later, when I was standing behind him as he and his friends were playing video games, and they didn't know that I was there, and one of his friends said, my dad's got the coolest job in the whole world because he builds skyscrapers, and that sounded really good to me. And Stevie's other friend said, well, actually, my dad's got the coolest job in the whole world because he works in a restaurant and he gets to eat all the desserts he wants to any time, <laughs> which sounded great to me, actually. And uh, so then, much to my surprise, my son, Steve, said, well, actually, my dad's got the best job in the whole world. And I'm thinking, is he going to say, well, dad's in charge of the radiology department or dad's a doctor? Well, what he ended up saying was, uh, my dad, I went to my dad's work, my dad's got the coolest job in the whole world because he gets to play video games all day. <laughs> and so what I'd like to do is just um, very briefly, um, and I'm not on the program, um, Mira had asked me to say just a, a few words about sort of the imaging core that we have to assess uh, um, not just healthy aging, but actually um, the population that we're looking at is a population interested in healthy anti-aging and uh, reversing the, the uh, process. Um, Sarah gave a great talk this morning, and uh, one of the things I was struck by was the fact that in the U.S. there's going to, um, they're predicted to be six million um, Americans who are greater than 100 years old by, again, the year 2080. And, um, you know, the question is, is um, there's a lot of people who are around in the U.S. and elsewhere who don't have the patience to wait until 2080 um, to be able to uh, see significant changes with regard to uh, longevity. And one of the questions is, are there opportunities for improvement? And so some of the work that I've done is working with a core of folks who are interested in very aggressive reversal of, uh, of aging and uh, doing some research in that area. And one of the challenges is, how does one actually know if one's been successful in potentially being able to, uh, to do that? And so what are some of the biggest contributors to longevity? Well, um, and you know, are there any opportunities for improvement? Well, genes, can we do anything about those? No. We heard this morning some great um, statistics about gender differences between men and women, and certainly that's not an easy fix either. Um, prenatal and early childhood environment and illness is something you really can't reverse. Marital status is something that we have a little bit of uh, control over, um, admittedly. Uh, socioeconomic status, maybe a little bit. Uh, education uh, has a, a, a significant impact on longevity, and we have some ability to adjust that. Ethnicity, um, uh, life expectancy ranged from uh, 72 years for non-Hispanic black males to 83.7 in the U.S. for Hispanic females, but we really can't adjust ethnicity. And then there's uh, lifestyle, and we heard that uh, even obesity um, really does not seem to have that much of an impact on, um, on longevity. So this is from uh, the cover of Time magazine. Um, back uh, just um, literally a, a, um, several months ago. And uh, the cover was kind of an intriguing. This baby could live to be 142 years old. And uh, this was based on some research that had done in, been done in mice using uh, rapamycin or everolimus. And so one of the basic questions um, that um, folks are asking is can aging itself be classified as a disease? Can we essentially say that if we could reverse aging, that simultaneously, without tackling any one disease, you could potentially tackle all diseases, cancers, Alzheimer's disease, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, et cetera? And uh, so in general, traditional funding sources have emphasized treatment or prevention of specific diseases, but there's an incredibly tiny percent of dollars that have been uh, devoted to uh, actually looking at prevention and looking at age potentially as a disease. 
There's a huge number of companies that are in, the, uh, in this space at this point. Calico very famously proclaims that they are the bell labs of uh, aging research uh, in the US. They're funded by uh, Google. And at this point, they're mainly doing basic science research and they're pretty much um, underground as far as what they're doing and you really can't find out very much information. Unity Biotechnology, um, AgeX, which is looking at combinations of telomerase therapy and induced tissue regeneration. Um, Senolytic Research is a company, uh, i -Core, that's um, uh, looking at quote unquote clearing lysosome uh, garbage using uh, senolytic research. Um, OSN um, that is looking at essentially creating a DNA construct that um, looks at senescent cells and tries to uh, destroy those cells. Um, Leucadia or Leucadia for Alzheimer's disease. And then very interesting in silico, um, which essentially um, creates tools for researchers um, using uh, artificial intelligence for uh, drug discovery and aging research. So there's a huge number of efforts and an unprecedented number of dollars. I'd asked a question this morning about um, longevity of Neanderthals or, or ancient man in comparison to today. And the amount of dollars and effort being put into this uh, anti-aging research is incredible. And one of the questions is, is you know, will it be effective? And if it is, how do we know it? Um, there have been lots of theories about aging. I won't go into the specifics of those due to time. And this is a really interesting um, uh, graphic or figure that I'm not going to go into in great detail, except to say that um, there's a number of different approaches using um, a number of different interventions, rapamycin, um, calorie restriction, uh, resveratrol, and also um, a number of different approaches to being able to identify senescent cells, old cells, and be able to essentially um, get rid of those old cells. There are a number of efforts with stem cell therapies and a number of others that are ongoing um, as we speak. And uh, you know, this is just an example of looking at the potential to generate new cells to replace senescent ones and being able potentially to be able to inject um, one's own stem cells into one's body and have the, um, this parabiotic um, effect where you essentially have um, the ability to take your own cells that are much, much younger and be able to uh, use those to be able to um, reverse some of the effects of uh, aging or minimize some of those. And there's a tremendous amount of research in many of these different areas and many different uh, interventions. Very interestingly, just now, there's an ongoing trial that is just starting um, that is FDA approved um, looking at metformin. And Anir um, Barzilai, director of uh, the Institute of Aging Research at Albert Einstein, is going to take 6,000 patients over six years and use metformin, which is only about five cents a pill or so, to look at um, heart attack, dementia, and cancer. And so giving these patients um, metformin in a preventative way and then studying to see whether or not the studies that have been done in animals and some of the compelling studies in humans um, demonstrate decrease in myocardial infarction, decrease in dementia, and uh, decrease in uh, cancer rates. This is a groundbreaking study in a lot of ways because it's the first time that there's been a major US government-sponsored study that I know of that looks at this type of uh, sort of um, age um, reversal or, or at least um, a uh, preventative uh, medication. There are lots of different types of studies that are ongoing with all these billions of dollars that are coming mainly from uh, private resources. Looking at what I mentioned, uh, parabiosis studies, looking at you know old studies in mice where they took older animals and younger animals, connected them their bloodstreams together and found the older animals did really well and had reversal of a lot of the phenotypic signs of uh, age. And uh, unfortunately, the younger mice that were tied to them didn't do quite as well as the, uh, the older mice because they showed signs of aging. But the potential to be able to use stem cells to create, um, using your own cells, the equivalent of that parabiosis. Um, lots of people are looking at cryonics now, which I'm not going to go into. Um, the ability to be able to um, look at amyloid accumulation and particularly uh, transthyretin uh, amyloid and being able to uh, um, potentially reduce uh, that amyloid, which is thought now in some studies to be the major cause of death, of death in supercentarians. Calorie restriction is something that you've all heard about and there's an increasing amount of 
uh, uh, research to show that it does seem to essentially slow down aging, but to a relatively small amount. And people have suggested intermittent um, fasting as something that um, has a similar impact to uh, prolonged fasting. Um, uh, gut mi microbes are something actually transplanting um, gut microbes from older animals to younger animals has shown some really interesting work. Regenerative medicine, it's been talked about a little bit today. Bioprinting of, uh, of tissues and, and creating uh, small organoids, um, lots of um, advances there. And so one of the questions for somebody like me is, are there biomarkers of aging? With all this, these billions of dollars of research, are there ways to be able to try to document from lab studies and imaging studies what the impact is? And so we're doing a variety of different types of, of studies on this type of population that are, under, that are doing some of these uh, trials, um, including diffusion tensor imaging, which is an extraordinarily sensitive way and functional mechanism within the brain to look at very, very um, subtle uh, um, changes um, in uh, brain function. A flare MRI where you can see some uh, paraventricular lesions, and some people have looked at um, white matter uh, hyperintensities on flare to, to track interventions uh, with aging. One of the most um, sensitive ways to be able to look at very early cardiovascular disease is not to wait for plaques to form, but to look at hyperplasia of the intima media of the, um, of the carotids, uh, liver elastography using ultrasound. Here's a MESA study that demonstrated a really strong predictive value of coronary artery uh, I'm sorry, of coronary uh, calcification assessment in comparison with a uh, plaque assessment, and some really excellent um, predictive value um, for a number of different diseases just looking at um, coronary artery uh, calcium scores. So part of the other um, work that we end up doing is looking at the potential to use large databases like the VA's uh, Vinci corporate data warehouse with 32 million patients. The, um, uh, GPRD or CPRD uh, database in the United Kingdom has been used in many different ways. One of the frustrations that I've had and colleagues have had is it's very difficult to um, get these databases. There are billions of dollars um, that have been spent with NIH clinical trials and supposedly the data is accessible. But for example, if I have a patient in front of me who has a pediatric brain tumor and I'm talking to that person's parents, in order to get the data that I need from the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium, I need to send a copy of my CV, my data, my research project, and um, wait a few weeks until a committee determines whether or not I can get it. That is the wrong model. The, the data needs to be opened up and made significantly more transparent. The data needs to be uh, indexed. And along these lines of uh, healthy aging and, and research, there are really interesting databases that are out there. I'm just going to conclude with one that we have actually managed to get access to, most of the data, but there's still, even 15 years later or after it was uh, started, they're still keeping some of the data back in case they want to publish, quote unquote. So this is a data set PLCO with 155,000 participants who signed up presumably for screening for prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer. But those patients, 155,000, had 800 parameters that were collected. Um, uh, are you on ibuprofen? What's your age? What's your smoking history? Do you exercise? Do you have a history of previous cancer? An incredible array of data. Um, and uh, lots of really interesting things have been published in an analysis of that, um, th the data set. What we have done is we've downloaded the data set, um, pretty much it's in, in its entirety, at least as much as they were able to share, and then created a real-time online tool. So you can take any of the 800 parameters that you want and um, type those parameters in and then have an instant assessment of patients like the one that you typed in with an instant response to the relative likelihood of 40 different types of cancers and overall mortality. So if we wanted to do research like what John did, for example, in our two seconds, we could um, come up with a hypothesis. Let's say our hypothesis is that the use of ibuprofen um, decreases the cancer risk um, for a colorectal cancer. So literally using this tool, selecting um, the subset of the 155,000 that were on ibuprofen, um, and then controlling for any other variables that we want to or, or not, um, and then running it, this um, analysis runs in somewhere under two seconds or so. And so the potential to be able to have databases such as this 
to be able to do real-time interaction for research purposes, for physician routine care, and even for patient consumer tools to be able to allow one to be able to interact real-time, I think is a really exciting thing that we may end up doing in the future and may contribute significantly to um, healthy aging or, or as, uh, um, some of the things that we're doing, healthy anti-aging. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and stop remarks there and maybe leave some of those things as food for thought during uh, lunch. I, John talked about glucose, and I'm sure all of our glucose levels are, are probably uh, varied at this point. So thank you, Mira, very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be able to present and share some of the things we're doing. Appreciate it. Or comments? Yeah. Yes. Just a quick, maybe a bit provocative. Sure. You talked about um, you could control if you wanted for various things. Yes. Obviously, it takes a huge amount of expertise to know what you need to control for you. Yep. Do you ever think about the liability of the actions inside that you can generate through settings? So, yeah, so uh, we get a lot of questions about the liability of, you know, um, this is a really powerful tool, and you need somebody with John's expertise, for example, to really be able to run those sorts of queries for doing research purposes. But right now, your doctor is making anecdotal, qualitative um, determinations about your care. And in general, we don't have tools that allow us to even be able to make um, estimated or, um, or, or approximation guess, guesses. And so I think what you're saying is absolutely true. There are all sorts of pitfalls and fallacies. If you wanted to look at whether or not height has an association with breast cancer, for example, and you just ran height in this database in breast cancer, what you'd find would be that um, being taller is protective against breast cancer. But it's because males have less breast cancer, and males are taller in general than females. So you're absolutely right. You can't just run it blindly. But on the other hand, being able to have real-time full access to a database such as this with some tools within it that would end up helping one to be able to control for those factors can make an incredible difference. And so making these databases that we've spent billions of dollars for more transparent for um, clinicians, more transparent for researchers, more transparent for patients to be used maybe with wizards that would allow one to be able to avoid some of those pitfalls, I think is where we need to go in the, in the future. And, you know, Collins and many others have, have um, written a lot about why it's so important to have access to data. But in reality, as somebody that searches for these types of data constantly to turn them into these sorts of tools, it's extraordinarily difficult to, to get them. I was encouraged by the, um, you know, our Danish colleagues potentially sharing some of the data and uh, in the UK. But what I found is not only in the US but around the world, getting access to the data is a lot more of a theoretical prospect than a, than a real prospect. I know that, yes. With it, yep. that's why I'm yes, it's a, it's a great point and it's a great caveat, but I don't think it makes me want to stop opening up the data and making it transparent. It's just there's that caveat associated with it, and it's really important to point that out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think the tools for the doctors has to be there. Yes. And as much as cases that you see, it's okay, even if it's you, if you and even if you don't have all the data about each yes. uh, each example. But speaking about the cohorts, I want to ask you, first of all, um, we were talking like in the morning with her, what I said about the micro and macro. Yes. And does it uh, have only the clinical or does it have any background or does it have more data? That's first. And second, uh, how much is this da data coherent, you know, like missing values or different treatment yep. and so on? Because otherwise, like the ADMI, the Alzheimer's data database, it's misleading yep. just because of the missing values. Right. So uh, I, uh, the reason I used PLCO as an example is it's highly curated. There is practically practically no missing data, 
They spent a half of a quarter of a billion dollars on it. It's highly structured. It has 800 variables on each patient, which were carefully followed, you know, for now over 15 years or so. I mean, one great, one fascinating thing about the culture with even PLCO, which I'm holding up as a great example, is they still haven't released the drug data that the patients are on because the original PIs might want to publish something. Well, this is 15 years later, and so you know we've got. 800 variables, I want to still know the medications that the patients are on. To your point, if I wanted to do the same thing for the Department of Veterans Affairs data with the 32 million patients, then I go into the electronic medical record and there's contradictory data and there's missing data. But still, you know, having access to those data and trying to figure out from that how we can have insights will only improve the way that we practice anecdotal and qualitative medicine at, at this point. So I, I think you and Allison are absolutely right that we need to have a lot of of um, essentially caution with regard to some of the pitfalls associated with it, but opening up the data I think will be tremendous. And in the aging community and those of us who are studying that, there's a lot of databases that are out there that we hear about, that we read about. I'd love to be able to interact with, uh, with those data sets for the um, clinical decision support tools, because after all, what it's all about is translating this to daily practice. And there seems to be a chasm between the research and translation to daily practice, and it would be great to close that a little bit.